Shalom from Jerusalem, Watchmen Talk, a series of conversations with security experts and practitioners. And our guest uh, today is a uh, retired general and ambassador, Matan Vilnai, also a former minister. And uh, General Vilnai is one of Israel's most illustrious and distinguished soldiers, then turned politician, then turned diplomat. He has taken part in um, most of Israel's wars, campaigns, and uh, other actions uh, throughout uh, the years. And uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, you know, um, this um, uh, serious Watchmen talk uh, is derived from the uh, Watchmen, which uh, the prophet Isaiah said, I have posted Watchmen on your walls. Um, and uh, you who uh, were born uh, here in this city, Jerusalem, uh, not only uh, can tell all of us about it, but also uh, having been born on the um, uh, festival of uh, Shavuot or Pentecost, um, your name, Matan, which means giving, uh, is supposedly the first such name uh, in Israel. Now there are many. Now there but, are many, yeah. But you are the original. I, one. I believe that I'm the original, yeah. You also share your birthday with Moshe Dayan, another uh, soldier uh, who was it, born on May 20th. Of May 20th, yeah. Yes, but right, uh, several yeah. years earlier. Yeah. Um, and because you belong to and exemplify a certain generation of Israelis born a few years before the country was established and then taking part in all of the wars in the 60s, the 70s and 80s, do you remember anything from the uh, four years uh, you spent here during the British mandate and you, before the establishment of the abso state? Absolutely. You won't believe it. When you tell me to come here, I lived 500 meters from here when I was a kid. And Jerusalem was besieged. And in Jerusalem were the six airborne division. Paratroopers. The paratroopers. The first paratrooper that I saw in my life was a British one. They used to uh, drive their jeeps across our neighborhood. And we used to run to chase them. It was like chewing gum, chewing gum. This is my English from this chewing gum. <laughs> and uh, I remember them very well when they searched our home. And uh, I remember the siege. Very close to here, now it's Gansaki, was the airstrip that connected Jerusalem to, to the main body of Israel. We as kids used to run to see the airplanes that came to the air, airstrip. I remember one Ben Gurion disembarked from one of the airplanes. He said, the Ben Gurion is a god. And I remember a lot about it. And when I came here and would think to myself, we were to park and all this, I feel that I am at home. This is my neighborhood. This uh, airstrip um, also witnessed one of the crashes during the War of Independence uh, uh, with two crew members, one of whom was a female, yeah. um, and they died in, uh, in this crash uh, right in front of, of uh, several uh, Zahar, spectators. Zahar Levito. So you grew up in uh, Jerusalem. Your father, Zeev Nai, was <laughs> um, a very famous expert on uh, archaeology, history. Um, he wrote more than 100 books about Israel. <coughs> he called himself, himself not a geographer, not a college, but landscaper. I'm coming from the land, landscaper. This was his profession, landscaper. And actually in 1967, uh, where you were not uh, in this part of, uh, of the country, no. um, he helped um, the reserve troops survey uh, the, uh, the walls of Jerusalem in order to, to breach them or to bypass them. Oh, it started with, in 48. In 48, uh, he was then younger, of course, he was 48 years old. And he served in the intelligence in Jerusalem because he knew the area like everything. And he was one of the, you can say, pathfinders 
for our soldiers there. Yeah, our unit. Now, you went uh, um, from Jerusalem to Haifa to uh, a military boarding school, which was quite rare at the time. Um, we are talking about uh, the late uh, uh, 50s. Late. Uh, 50, Early 60s, yeah, late, late, late 50s. 50s. Yeah, late 50s. How, how does a kid in Israel, in those years uh, where there was uh, hardly any, any security tension, this was after the Sinai campaign of 1956, a few years before the 1967 uh, war, and uh, people thought that um, there's not going to but be a war for years, many years. I grew, as you mentioned before, during the siege of Jerusalem in 48. And from my first days, I remember, I remember my father that was a Zionist 100%. He, they fled there from Kishinev, after the riots in Kishinev, to Haifa, not to America. Most of the Jews fled to America. They fled to Jerusalem, because, to Haifa, <coughs> because his father, my grandfather that I met, never met, was a Zionist. And he came there, and he told me all the time, we must be strong in order to survive. I grew up along this line, and he was against my uh, going to the boarding school in, in the rally. Also, he was a graduate of the rally in Haifa. The rally high school in Haifa. Because he would like that I will stay at home as much as I can. By the way, before we get to the uh, military boarding school, uh, you are one of uh, those uh, rare Israelis who, as a child, knew both Ehud Barak and the Netanyahu's. Yeah. Um, how did that happen? Uh, Netanyahu was the little uh, brother of Yoni. Yoni was uh, about my age, younger than me one year. And uh, Bibi was uh, the kid there. Five years also, younger. Most of the time they spent in New York, not in Jerusalem. And his father and my father, both of them, were graduates of a college in Philly, in Philadelphia, uh, Dropsy College. There was a Dropsy College in Philadelphia. Dropsy was a wealthy uh, American Jew that uh, put his money into this college after his name. And the college dealt with Judaism and the Middle East, especially for my father and for the father of Netanyahu. And both of them uh, studied there in, uh, in Philly, in uh, Dropsy College. I visited there several years ago when I was a, min a minister or a general, I don't, I don't remember. I went there to say it's interesting. And uh, we were in the same neighborhood in Jerusalem. But uh, Ehud Barak was another Ehud childhood Barak friend. Ehud Barak is from a kibbutz, from Ismail Shor. And my father went to London to finish his first grade, something like this. And they sent us, me and my brother, to the kibbutz, to a doctor that was a friend in Mishmar Shalom. After one day, we moved from the doctor to the next door to Brug family. Brug is Barak. And uh, my, father, my, my brother is exactly the age of old. I am the age of Avinoam, of his brother. And we and their mother used, used to be Esther. She passed away hundred years ago, something like this. Hundred years old, something like this. And uh, we grew together, and we became friends. Did it um, have any effect later when you were all colonels and lieutenant colonels? Nothing. He was older than me, two or three years, so he mobilized before me, and uh, we met several times during the service. But nothing more than that, nothing more than that. So what happened um, when you were uh, 15, 16, 17 year old um, in the boarding school and you decided to make the army your career? It's, there is no answer. Because I went to the boarding school in order, it's, 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 it's nothing, to, you can't understand it, to serve my country. Now it's like uh, a joke. And we were, I went there to serve my country. And when I finished, I uh, volunteered to the paratrooper. For me, it was obvious. And every year, I used to sign for one year. 
because I said to myself, to re-enlist, to no, I'm not going to be a career officer, but because they offer me this, I'm going to do it. And then there are for this, I'm going to. And then one day I found myself more than 20 years in the army, in the rank I believe of a full colonel or something like this. And so I said, okay, so I'm going to stay in the army. I was more than 30 years old, 35 years old. I became a general, a one star, and uh, that's it. Um, what uh, sort of fundamentals did you get in boarding school? Was it values? Was it uh, the uh, military art? You had a very, very competent class. Uh, one of your um, uh, colleagues, Amnon Lippenschacht. Not colleague, roommate for two years in the, in the boarding school and one year in the officer calls. So he, so he was chief of staff and he, you were his deputy and you had other generals coming out of uh, this group. You know, in West Point, um, uh, during World War I, there was a class which is called the class the stars fell on, with Eisenhower and others. No, but there was a class during the Civil War that the class was divided between the South and the North. It's interesting. Okay. They knew each other from, from school. They knew the girlfriends, everything. Well, you were later in charge of the South, but in Israel, not... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, your, your division was in the North earlier, but then you had... Commanded uh, the Southern Command. The Southern yeah. Command. So uh, you joined the paratroopers, which were at the time the most coveted unit, uh, the uh, most prestigious uh, unit. But you probably thought that you missed your chance that uh, all, of, all of the action took place seven, eight years earlier. Absolutely. And you were sure that you missed it and you will never find. And then you find yourself in the middle of this. So, so you, you joined in 1962? 62, August 62. Immediately a squad leader. A squad leader because of the boarding school. And, and uh, you jumped even during uh, boarding school, your first... Um, uh, no, no, no. This is only later? No, but I'll tell you, I'm not sure that you know it. When I was a squad commander, my soldiers were from something, not the paratroopers. Very similar, but not the paratroopers. It was a secret. And then I realized that this is what you now can say openly, Sayyid Matkal, in those days, you can say these two words. Sir. The elite intelligence unit, which is under the uh, director of military intelligence. Exactly. And when I'm, uh, I, one day I'm going home, in order to report to the officer schools in Sunday morning. And then Friday evening, I got a, a call at my, I lived then in, with my parents, and the commander of the elite units, it's on the line. He said, Avram, he said, Matan, the soldier uh, said that they would like you to come with them. I said to him, but I'm going to the officer school to, uh, the day after tomorrow. He said to me, think about it. I shut it immediately, it rang, I pick it up, my battalion commander. You won't believe, I am a corporal. The commander of the special unit, my battalion commander that for us was God. He was killed after that in, in, in action in uh, the Jordan Valley when I was under his command. And uh, he said to me, Matan, I heard rumors about Sayyid Matkal. You are, belong to us and you must report Sunday morning to the officer's school. This is Arik Regev. Arik Regev. Arik, yeah. I said to him, okay, I belong to, to the, your battalion. And I went to the officer's school. And then they asked me again. It's a long story. So it's you, you story. probably felt uh, long story, yeah. very proud that uh, uh, these units uh, are vying for your services. Yeah, yeah. And then I, at the end, they offered me to be a battalion commander. I was a captain. And uh, the, the unit asked me to come to them to be the second in command. And I went there. And the commanding general of the central command told you that you must be the battalion commander under his command. And if not, I'm not going to be battalion commander in the power troopers anymore. And uh, it was a story. And I decided because I was free, 
I decided to go to, to the Union. But before that happened, this is uh, in the late 60s, uh, early 70s already, before that you took part in, in several uh, very important uh, actions. Um, now, of course, it's more than, than 50 years uh, in the past, but one was Samoa and one was Karame and was, one was Naja Hamadi. What was the character of the small, as we now see it, uh, Israeli Defense Force? <clears throat> I'll tell you. Now, when I am 77 years old, I see things differently. But the most important lesson that I got from home, from my father, not from the boarding, the military boarding school, but from my father. And then in life, the, the most important thing is first of all, to take the initiative all the time. You don't believe no one, only yourself. And you have to do it the way that you believe that you must do it. You don't believe your superiors? No, no. You understand them, yeah, they are the, your superiors, or you depend on them in some way or another. But at the end, you are on the ground, you see the situation, you evaluate it, and you take the decisions. It's very important to understand it. And you know, and you, uh, Dan Shomron, you knew Dan Shomron. He was a friend of us. He was the chief of staff. When I was a company commander, he was second in command in our battalion. He was something special. And when they took, for example, the hostages to uh, Antebbe. We will get to Antebbe. So we'll talk about this later. We took the initiative to do it, no one else. We decided that we were going to do it. But if you will talk about it later, we'll talk later. You have to give your example, and you have to be on the front line, and you have to be on the ground and to do it. Don't ask others to do it, do it by yourself, and give the example to the other people. In late 1968, you were uh, wounded, badly wounded earlier, but in late 1968, um, you commanded a special operation uh, in Naja Hamadi, Naj Hamadi. Uh, called Operation Shock, and um, Mivza Helem. Helem, yeah, Helem. Uh, shock, oh, shock in, in English, yeah. yes. Um, and at that time, uh, when when you took off from Sharm el Sheikh or wherever you you took off from Sharm el Sheikh in uh, helicopters, um, the defense minister and the chief of operations told you, and you were a captain uh, at the time, on the ground you are the chief of staff. Absolutely. W what is that doctrine? What does it mean? First of all, it was a daring operation because it was the first time that we had to go to Upper Egypt with helicopters. It was the first time, hundreds of kilometers behind the enemy lines. On the Nile. On the Nile. Beyond the Nile. We crossed the Nile. You won't believe it. You, we crossed the Nile. And I was then a second in command in a part of a battalion. They called me back to my original unit, and they said, now you are back the commander because you are going to this operation. It's never happened. Not before and not after that. It never happened. This is actually what Ehud Barak was supposed to do at Entebbe before he was sent to Nairobi. Yeah. Uh, he I was recalled to his old unit, Sayeret Matkal, uh, to be... But Yoni Netanyahu's superior. They, he, he but this is very me. rare. Usually you yeah. let the commander yeah. command. No, but they asked me to come back to the unit. Think about the unit commander. When I come, my, and the unit commander is from Jerusalem, around the, in this neighborhood. Too. God Negbi. God Negbi, yeah. And we flew and we crossed the Nile. And everything was first time. Everything there was first time. And in this case, the initiative came from the general headquarters, in this case. But as Barlev, the chief of staff, told me, and Moshe Dayan told me, you are the chief of staff on the ground. It's your decisions. Whether to abort or to continue? Everything. And after we landed, first, first thing, you tried to have a, a connection with the headquarters in Israel. 
What you what you wanted to do, if if people still remember the old World War II movie, The Dam Busters, um, you you had uh, to throw depth charges uh, on on bridges and uh, transform- no, my, transformation. My mission was a transportation station, electric transportation, transformation. Station, and I uh, had to to destroy it. And first of all, I tried to have connection to Israel. But this this was in order, just to give the background, because the Egyptians started shelling the uh, Israeli troops on the eastern side of the canal, and they had no bunkers yet. The the idea was to hit them uh, in their rear and to uh, get all the lights off in Upper Egypt. It was a very... A distinguished understanding of the general headquarters. It's not happened many times, but it happened at this time, that you don't have to fight the Egyptians on the line because you are not prepared for that. They have on, on their side more than 1,000 uh, guns. We have on our side 15, 14 at the most, and there is no chance and no bunkers. And you side. were only a team or a platoon of, of what, a dozen soldiers? Uh, 14. 14 soldiers in, in one helicopter It, or two? Two. It's so one, this it's wonderful example. It, oh, this is a tactical action for strategic purposes. Exactly, exactly. And the general headquarters decided to hit the Egyptians back in the rear, deep in the rear, so they would understand that we can do everything. If you would like one day, we can come to Nasser, to the president, to take him back to Israel. And uh, we achieved it. We achieved 14 soldiers deep in enemy area without communication to, to Israel. It's not easy to do it. And my first decision was, the order was, the pre-order was, you have to stay and then we will come to take you if there is no communication. I said to, to myself, it's too cold. I don't you mean the helicopters offloaded you? Offloaded. Off- flew and back and then you were supposed to pick you up? After several hours, and we had to, to have the mission. But we have no communication, so the, the order was you have to stay and to wait to the helicopter because you can't talk with anyone. And I decided to, to, to continue. When I came back, after the story, there, there, there are no guards, there were guards, uh, we have to fight them. Intelligence wasn't and, excellent. Intelligence always is intelligence. And... I clashed with one of the guard, of the Egyptian guard. If you saw the movie of uh, Gregory Peck. Uh, Which one? Old one, when you were kids. They had the, the two people in the desert street with their guns. Yes, in the Western, What uh, is hi, the high noon. High noon. Exactly, exactly, exactly. High noon, yeah. And Gary Cooper. I, Gary Cooper, exactly, Gary Cooper. It was the same situation, an Egyptian soldier and me. I know, I knew that he is Egyptian. He knew nothing because I came from out of, no, of nowhere. In the dark. In the, uh, yeah, and we, we fight each other. And, and then... You mean hand-to-hand combat? No, 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 no. It was it with a Mayuzi. Uh, Some machine guns. Machine gun, machine gun yeah. And at the end, we, uh, we implement our mission, and we went back. And uh, after I landed, Moshe Dayan... The defense minister. The defense minister that was a figure in those days. He called my father. He told him what I have done. And he said to him, a sentence, a wonderful sentence that uh, I'm not, you, you will understand it, but it's very, uh, he said, if they would like to have a good chief of staff, Matan will be one of them. But I'm not sure that they would like to have a good chief of staff. And as a wise man told your mother something similar. Something like this, yeah. They were in the same family, of course. They family. were brothers-in-law, yeah. Yeah. at the time, at least. But Naj Hamadi, it's, it's an example for a fresh understanding in the higher echelons. When I was in the higher echelons, I'll always ask myself if I'm doing the right thing or maybe I'm like them. 
It's a problem. It's a problem. It's not an easy problem. It's a problem. General Villeneuve, um, how did you um, get your your wounds, your battle wounds, and what impact did it have uh, on your thinking regarding military operations? I, it was in uh, Samoa. Jordan, uh, November of 1966. 13th of November, 7 o'clock in the morning, 1966, before the 67 war. I was a company commander of the operational uh, company of, the, of my uh, battalion. The, 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 only, the only soldier killed there was the battalion commander? My, my commander next to me. He was killed, Yoav. He was killed next to me, the battalion commander. Yoav Shacham. Yoav Shacham. And uh, we jumped for our APCs in the streets of a small village, Samoa, which mentioned in the Bible. I remember everything. There is a synagogue there. From the now street. it's under Israeli control, not far from yeah, Hebron. Yeah, now it's, uh, it's in part of the West Bank. And... Uh, a legionnaire and Arab legion soldiers jumped behind the wall and from eight, 10 meters, we shot me. And he was uh, quicker than me. I arrived my Uzi, he shot me. And uh, I was badly wounded in the chest, in the right side of the chest, which was, I was dead. And uh, I was shocked. They can kill. They can kill me. It's serious. How they can do it? They are legionnaires, although they are wonderful soldiers. They are good soldiers. Right? The the Jordanian army. And uh, the lesson is that you must be a good soldier. <laughs> General Matan Vilnai, we will uh, continue and have another uh, chapter uh, soon. Uh, so let's stop here. And um, we are a bit tense. We don't know whether you will recover from your wounds, <laughs> what will happen. So until next time, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.